Okay, thank you so much for having us. Thanks to Lori and Stuart and Fest Forums. This is my first time. And just quickly, may I say that, uh, you know, music and movies and the arts and communities coming together um, strikes me as a more important thing than perhaps it did two weeks ago. So I really appreciate everybody here and the, and the things that people do. Um, let me introduce the panel. Uh, let's see, we'll start all the way over here with, with Noah. Um, Noah, is, Noah Cowan is the executive director of the San Francisco Film Society. He's been doing that since March 2014. He joined the SFFS after five years at the helm of the Toronto International Film Festival's Bell Lightbox, the landmark cinema space, museum space in Toronto. Um, so I'm going to keep this short, but let, let's, let's move on. Um, the next person to his immediate right is Sharon Badal. Did I pronounce that right, Sharon? Badal, sorry. Um, she is the vice president of filmmaker relations and shorts programming at Tribeca. Um, she's been with the festival since it began in 2001 and has produced special projects for Tribeca since 1999. Her first job was at age 14 as an usher in her father's suburban movie theater. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, to her immediate right, we have uh, Mike Shea, who has been the executive director of South by Southwest since 1990. Did I get your title right there, Mike? Yeah, yeah OK. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to say that I've been to South by Southwest 15 times, so I'm, I'm uh, especially excited to have you here. Um, South by Southwest has had, I, I did some, a bit of independent research on your bio, it's had a uh, $325.3 million impact on Austin, Texas's economy. Um, this past year, participants booked about 59,000 room nights at area hotels, um, and there were 140,000 attendees this year. Um, and uh, I think they averaged about 1.5 hours of sleep a night. That's, uh, that's my own estimate. Um, to his immediate right, we have Alex Machurov. He is, <laughs> he is the, I should have corrected, I should have uh, confirmed these earlier. The Senior Director of New Business Development and Brand Partnerships at Superfly, um, where he splits his duties equally between the company's festivals, which include the world-famous Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival in Manchester, Texas, and the Outside Lands Music and Arts Festival in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. Um, he has 15 years of experience developing strategic brand partnerships in the music and live events space. Um, and then immediately to my left here, um, we have David Allen Burnell the second. He is the... Uh, um, Am I, am, am I mangling all the pronunciations? I'm sorry about that. You guys can correct me. I apologize. Um, he is the, uh, the CLM of Pebble Beach and Los Angeles Food and Wine Festivals, the uh, CEO and co-founder of Coastal Luxury Management, an idea kitchen with a current focus in the hospitality and lifestyle sectors. Um, so welcome, panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the subject for today is convergence. And uh, I guess I'm going to start um, with Alex and talk about the idea of a music festival that incorporates other artistic elements, like food and comedy and perhaps film. You guys have done that quite a bit over the years. Can you talk a little bit about how, how, how challenging it is to sort of seamlessly put that, those things into your, into your core business? Sure. Um, I think uh, what what we started doing at Bonnaroo, as a perfect example, is uh, we launched Bonnaroo in 2002, and it was just as the iPod generation was starting to come uh, about. And what we started noticing is that uh, music fans are not just fans of heavy metal or EDM or hip hop, they were fans of all different types of music. Um, and then at the same time, uh, building a festival where it's a four-day festival where people are living out um, and camping out. We wanted to build a full 360-degree immersive experience, which also includes comedy, which also includes a cinema tent, um, which over the last few years has also included adding culinary and, and mixology experiences. I mean, essentially our fans are expecting the festival producer to hit every single passion point. Uh, especially when they're living on site of the festival. And what we did is the same thing at, at Outside Lands. Uh, Outside Lands in Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, sophisticated crowd. Wine is obviously a big part of that community. 
Good food is obviously a big part of that community. So what we wanted to do is rather than just building a festival with just music on stages, we wanted to adopt everything that uh, speaks to our fans at that festival. And of course, um, you know, all those little bits and pieces make it a fully immersive experience. Fans this day and age, especially at music festivals, expect um, you know, a, a full experience as opposed to just music. That makes sense. Dave, you and I were talking earlier about the concept of how challenging it is. You know, you guys are obviously focused on food and wine, um, but you've incorporated music events and live music events over the years. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and some of the challenges that you've had in integrating those, thing, those things together. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, Alex hit on it. I guess you can hear me on this thing. Um, and whether you're in food and wine or you, music, we started as a, very much a food and wine focused Festival with Pebble Beach Food and Wine is our first one, which we're having, and we're going on our 10th anniversary. Um, so, but it was a very obvious thing, I think, across festivals everywhere that it wasn't, we didn't have to be so focused on just the thing that we came to do because everyone likes music, everyone likes cinema, everyone likes art, everyone likes all of these various components. And I think the thing for every festival is to figure out how you overlay these various elements in a meaningful way for who you feel your customer. Because you know, we, we started, when we did Los Angeles Food and Wine Festival, so we're going on our seventh year of that, we wanted music to be a, a part of the backbone, the sort of celebrity convergence, if you will. So we were hosting lunches with Fergie, and we'd do a wine tasting with Drew Barrymore, and then we'd still have like Train or Common or The Roots perform and do these things, Mike D, do something. And what's, what's interesting, though, know, is since we aren't coming first with the music component, we're coming very much first with the 150 chefs we're bringing in all these wineries, that you have to figure out how you um, build it in so that the consumer's not looking at, let's say, said ticket price. I think one of the things we're talking about challenge-wise is the cost of entertainment. So if you're already focused on food and wine and you want to lay in this really cool music piece, especially if you're going to get named acts, you're going to add hundreds of thousands of dollars of expense really, really quickly. And you have to figure out how you're going to build that into the experience so people aren't saying, well, God, that seems like a really expensive ticket for, quote, unquote, the roots or whoever it is. But they're forgetting that Daniel Balud's over there, like you know, doing caviar tacos for you. So the balance, I think, right there, and figuring out how you bring it to your specific festival guest, because I think all of the festivals that we have here are very—they're dip a little bit different. They have some some of the shared DNA, but um, you really need to understand how you're doing it, because it can become ex very expensive if uh, if you don't have a really tight plan. That makes sense. Um, let's bring in our film people. Um, start starting with Sharon and and, and then Noah. Um, you know, you have experimented with some of this. I mean, Sharon, you did an event recently with the Rolling Stones, and, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk about, was that a value add? Is that something that's, that's easy to add? And, and also maybe discuss something that Dave just touched on brief, briefly, which is the pricing of it. Does it create a different pricing structure? Well, I was in London uh, teaching, uh, producing a London intensive for NYU in June, and I went to the Saatchi Gallery, I took my students there and there was uh, an exhibition there called Exhibitionism, the Rolling Stones, which was the history of the 50 years. And when I came back to New York, uh, because we had been talking, and I'm sure we all talk about, what can we do outside of the bricks and mortar festival date? How do we expand Tribeca to not just April 19th to 30th? And so I got back and I talked to, to my boss, Jane Rosenthal, and she said, well, is it coming to New York? It, it, you know, maybe we should do something. And to make a very long story short, it's turned into kind of a bunch of things that started off with last Friday, November 11th, we did uh, a screening of the Rolling Stones concert film, the brand new concert film called Havana Moon in, uh, in a very big space called Spring Studios and we made it like a concert experience and we called it a concert style screening. So we had the bar it was open, we had amazing Dolby 7.1 surround sound, the screen was huge, it was loud. You couldn't tell the difference between the audience you know, yelling at the end of a song and the audience in Cuba on the film yelling at the end of the song. And we did tiered ticketing because we knew that there was a certain demographic that just, the, the Stones fans, that just wanted to see the film. And so that was a lower price ticket. 
But then we did a VIP package ticket at a, at a higher price, at $100 a ticket, which then allowed them to get uh, the limited edition DVD uh, two CD set and some other Tribeca swag stuff and uh, open bar as opposed to cash bar, right? And um, that led that one kind of initial conversation about exhibitionism led to surprisingly a relationship now that's a partnership with the Rolling Stones with exhibitionism moving forward to other events that I can't really discuss at this point except to encourage you to, you know, no idea should be too big when you start out. It wor was worth the ask. I knew nobody. I totally researched it, just me, myself, and reached out and found somebody and pitched an idea called Tribeca Gets Stoned. And that was my idea. And it didn't wind up being Tribeca Gets Stoned, but that was my jumping off point. And it changed along the way. So, you know, that's, that's an example of us, A, trying to do stuff outside the festival, B, thinking about my audience in New York and what they'd want and considering the price point accordingly, and C, melding music with film accordingly. Yeah, go I ahead. just take jump off yeah. from there. The yeah. San Francisco Film Festival um, has been kind of a leader in, grab that for me, leader in kind of commissioning, co kind of co-commissioning with bands, uh, music and film presentations, essentially them accompanying um, an old silent film that we sort of come up, or an experimental films we come up together. And I guess it's sort of the big jumping off of this was about 10 years ago with They Might Be Giants. We did a big kind of uh, commission around a kind of an old black and white movie. And they actually toured that themselves around the country. But since then, we've worked with people like the Toon Yards and Will Oldham and um, um, Chibo Mato. And then this year, it's our 60th anniversary, so we're actually doing a bunch more. So, and really running the gamut from everything from Kronos Quartet to Asia Dump, Dub Foundation, Tracy Chapman. You know, very different kinds of curated um, um, shows. And musicians love them, and our audience loves them. And wh where it's really relevant, I think, for this room, if people want to talk about it, is that um, it was a really great demographic shifter for us um, from a marketing perspective. Film festivals tend to land a little on the older side um, in terms of who's coming out to like multiple films. Um, but these music shows, your demographic just plunges like 20 years. And then you have a, a great opportunity to actually speak to those audiences, to actually get them attracted to other films within your film festival. And so we tend to front load our music stuff as much as we can so we can continue to have that conversation. And it has truly had a material impact on the rest of the festival and um, what we're doing and the kind of the breadth of programming that we're allowed as a result. Um, the, other, the other comment I'd have about that is, I think I'm the only nonprofit festival up here, but if any of you are nonprofits, it's actually um, a really great way to speak to a different slice of donors um, who are actually more inclined to music than, than film. And so it actually allows you to actually like bring on new people. Um, presumably that also works from a sponsor perspective too, because there's sponsors who are going to actually be more interested in, in music than film as well. Sticking with Sharon and Noah for one second, and then I promise I'll get to you, Mike. I just, I just have one quick follow-up for them. And yeah. Uh, just <laughs> don't worry, Mike, we'll, we'll get to you. Um, so for, for Sharon and Noah specifically, can you talk about the, um, the, the opportunities that come when you have music-related films or documentaries um, and, and how that sort of can lead into bringing the artist on board for a live event or you know, when, when, when that's the right thing to do, when that might not be the right thing to do? You know, the, the musicians have their own schedules. And so, you know, we're blessed in the Bay Area, just we just have a lot of musicians around, and Los Angeles is also very, very close. And so um, sourcing talent isn't that complicated for us. They're either on the road or they're not, you know. And so, um, um, and, and uh, we found just about any musician we've approached is open to the idea. They love playing. Um, you know, any kind of musician seems to really enjoy the idea of playing uh, live to, to a film. It's kind of a fun project to take on. Um, the only times it can get complicated is when they want to do something that's got co some copyright issues um, from the original film. So we, uh, you know, we've been, um, you've had to gently urge people into different directions over the years um, from the projects they may have uh, initially wanted to do. I mean, the challenge is budgetary for, for us. It's because the, if you're doing something, a, a, a documentary, a music documentary, and then let's say you're having, you want the artist to perform 
like we did with uh, Alicia Keys last this year. You, you gotta have a pretty big budget because they have a pretty big entourage and they have a lot of needs in terms of staging and plotting and lighting and crew and load-in requirements and sound check requirements and all of this stuff. And that's where it can become prohibitive. So before you actually lock in anybody, I mean, my, uh, you could probably speak to this even better than I do, before you lock in someone to perform, you gotta make sure that you can afford it and that you can, and or you have the outreach to sponsors and partners that can um, provide the, the funding for it. Mike, hey. <laughs> I was gonna ask you, you can certainly answer uh, the, the issue that Sharon just raised, but I was also gonna ask you, you know, South by Southwest has so many different communities. You have the music and the film and the tech, and then there's comedy and there's food and all these different communities kind of coming together. Can you talk about, over the years, the challenges of bringing those communities together, not just in terms of getting the entertainment to participate, but the, the audiences too? Are they, do they blend? Do they, do they all get along? Are they all wanting to spend the same amount of money? That sort of thing. Well, one of the things that makes me a little bit of an, an outlier on this panel, I think, is that uh, South by Southwest, even though it's perceived by, by everyone as being uh, a consumer-oriented event, we're really not. We're, we're an industry-oriented event. Uh, we modeled ourselves on an event called the New Music Seminar in New York. Some of you might remember, uh, remember that from a long time ago. And the idea is that uh, uh, the music industry comes together. I mean, similar to, to here, you know, where the event uh, planning industry is and festival industry is getting together. Uh, the music industry gets together during the day. There are uh, exhibits, there are conference panels, and then at night there would be showcases and they would do uh, A&R talent scouting and, and that sort of thing. So that's that's really our origin myth is that uh, we, we started as a business event. We, we were basically B to B to B, you know, business to business to band or business to band to business or whatever the case is. Um, and then that sort of organically developed. Uh, the people inside our company had other interests besides music. Uh, they had interests in film, they had interests in technology. Uh, so in, uh, in 1994, we added film and technology, uh, the, the interactive event, and the, um, the different constituencies, uh, we found that uh, the world is not one dimensional and our people coming to our event were not one dimensional either. Either they weren't they weren't just like I, I'm I'm all about music. They're um, I'm about music but I would like to uh, uh, score films or uh, I'm, I'm I'm about film but I'd like to to do video and I'd like to stream online. Uh, just lots of lots of different people with different interests. So uh, the convergence aspect of of South by Southwest really uh, developed very organically. These were uh, we, we heard our people saying to us, well, I know I've got this music badge, but I really want to go to that interactive panel. Well, I've got this interactive badge, but I'd really like to go to those film screenings. Um, so it, it, it was not a question of, of us trying to, to force people into other areas. Uh, in a lot of ways, it was us trying to, uh, trying to respond to what they, what they wanted and, and break down the barriers that we had artificially set up between this kind of programming and, and that kind of programming. Uh, this year we've, uh, we've taken that even, even further uh, to where the different, uh, the different badges, you can buy a, uh, a platinum badge and you know, talk about your price points, it's $16.95. Um, uh, but your platinum badge gets you into everything, but if you just have a music or a film or an interactive, uh, we've, we've allowed uh, you to get into some of these other uh, activities that are, uh, uh, if they're not sold out or, or whatever the case is. Did, did I answer the question? Yeah. Oh, all right. right. Good. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a music business reporter, so that, that's my frame of reference. And, and I'm interested in the idea that, I mean, it seems like when you're a festival that is not necessarily a music festival, and you start to go looking for music talent to be part of your festival, suddenly your economics are, are different. Um, and I was, I was wondering if, um, and I'll get back to you, Alex, I promise, because, but uh, Dave and Sharon and Noah, I wonder if you could, talk about when you make that plunge and you start to have live music events, maybe to an extent comedy also. How does that affect the, economic, the economics of ticket pricing? How does that affect your, you know, does it give you an immediate return on investment sort of thing? Um, let's start here with you, Dave. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna add um, 
at least in my experience, we've got, we got the, the Kings of Music Festivals up here. So, it, but it, 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 when we add talent, it usually adds about another $300,000 at least in cost. So if you're going to add that to, and, and for our events, they don't go over 3,000 people. Because celebrity chefs only want to cook for so many people, and there's sometimes ways around that, but the, 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 at least the chefs that we invite, 3,000 is kind of it, and they don't really like that either. So you can't push it to you know some crazy number. So if you think about a $300,000 investment in talent to 3,000 person audience, without obviously just breaking even trying to recoup your cost, you're trying to get another $100 per person out of that ticket. And if you want to make some money on it, you're going to hopefully charge $150 or $200 more. So it starts to become a very different deal because now your ticket, instead of maybe $250, would be $450 or $400 for that same experience. And there's a there's a very careful balance there because you have to you're 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 enhancing your risk, of course, you know, in terms of like. And again, this is this is putting this piece on top of a food wine festival as opposed to having millions of dollars of talent in a, in a headline. But um, for that something specific, you have to you have to. You have to take a, look, a hard look and say, are people more people going to come out because? And it's not because they're also we're also paying more for that experience, and so there's a balance. So we do usually two of the three nights at Los Angeles Food and Wine Festival have some sort of uh, music component, and it definitely affects the way uh, our our ticket prices go. Sponsorship can help with that a lot as well. But I think that how you merchandise your festival is an important piece. So even if let's say for instance on the food and wine side, if you add the music component. You might not make any money on it at all. In fact, you may lose money on it. But if what it does is it brings us a, a, a sense of interest or sex appeal to either a consumer or uh, a sponsor that might not have been there before because now you're starting to be, have a little bit more robust programming, then there can be some some worthwhile return on investment for you there. That's not specifically going to you're not going to see that return on the actual investment in music by itself. Um, and so I think that's important. I think it goes the other direction too. Is that you know, if you are doing a different type of festival, like film or something, and you want to bring a whole bunch of celebrity chefs out, they're expensive. You know, Th Thomas Keller wants 55000 a day to show up, and that doesn't include whatever else, you know, all the food costs and team. So when, when you've got stuff like that going on, you have to say, well, God, did my customer want to spend that much more to have Thomas in there doing, you know, Kunamans, because that was really cool, but now my ticket price is completely different. So it's, it's very much a, a very individual balance, I think, based on what you're producing and who your target market is. Makes sense. Do you two want to touch on that and then? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our experience has been that, you know, um, the musicians that we're talking about, um, if they don't find it to be a really cool, interesting idea for them to do, we're not going to get to the financial place. Right. You know, so it's got to be, I mean, you know, what we offer is to do it in the historic Castro Theater. It's a really magical night. You know, this we can, we talk about the kinds of different audiences from San Francisco that we can bring into the, into the fold. And it usually sounds like a kind of a magical idea. When the numbers get a little bigger, we will seek sometimes uh, partners, usually in the region, either in other parts of California or on the West Coast, to create a sort of a tour. I mean, Asia Dub Foundation we're working with this year is massive. And so just to get them moving around, um, it's a lot of money, and so we need partners in order to do that, and we're going to do it, and it's fine. Um, it's a highly specialized thing, and sometimes big museums like to do kind of performative work like this, so we'll, we'll work with them on that basis. Um, on the food front, it's actually interesting. We've actually found, and I think you guys have been doing it too, is that because there's all this um, kind of new kind of television documentary work, in particular Chef's Table, mm -hmm. um, we've actually been able to get a lot of food stuff happening around film festivals in a way that we haven't before. Netflix is uh, deep pocketed and um, has been sort of helping make that happen um, because we did try and, we're in San Francisco, you know, food mecca, we've been trying to get food on the menu, so to speak, for the last few years and it was, it's been way too expensive to actually do that and create events around that and the chefs, it doesn't, they don't naturally gravitate towards what we're doing unless there's, they have their crazy big film fans. So there is a food angle, but it tends to be a bit narrower than the music one, I think. Okay. Alex, I want to ask you a slight devil's advocacy question, which is, you know, you've got Bonnaroo, you've got Outside Lands. People are coming to those things to see Springsteen and Dave Matthews Band and all these amazing, you know, music, top tier music acts already. Why even have comedy food? Why, why do that? Why, why is it important for your value add? Well, a, a few reasons. One is, um, there's, as anyone 
that's been paying attention to the festival industry. There's a lot of saturation out there. There's a lot of competition. The point of a festival in this day and age is to separate yourself from the others. Um, like I said, Bonnaroo, we launched those things in 2002. So that still to this day is one of the things that separates us from a lot of the other festivals out there. I think our fans are demanding it. Um, as I mentioned before, they're living on site or they're coming to San Francisco to Golden Gate Park for three days. They want a 360 degree experience. The other reason is, as Noah touched upon before, is it expands the demographics and expands the fan base. Um, typically a music fan or music festival fan is between the ages of 18 and 34 buying GA tickets. Suddenly when you start incorporating some of the elevated experiences like food, like at Outside Lands in Bonnaroo we have pop-up farm-to-table dinners that we sell to our fans. Um, it, it brings in more VIP ticket sales. At Bonnaroo we have something called a uh, Roll Like a Rockstar which is a super VIP which provides you with elevated food experiences. So suddenly, that's the bus one, isn't that the bus, the bus one? one? Yeah. So suddenly, by adding all these additional components, elevating the overall experience, you are now bringing in a new opportunity or a new fan base. And then the last thing I'll say is, Outside Lands being an, an example, from a brand partnership perspective, a music festival with just music on stages is one thing, and you have a limited amount of partners that you can bring in as brands. But when you start bringing in culinary and wine and craft beer, then suddenly that the, the ability to bring in non-endemic type of partners or partners that would stay away from just a music festival, the opportunity is there and, and revenue increases with it. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I wanna throw this open to questions from the audience very soon, but um, I wanna ask Mike something. Oh, did you have something to add, Noah? One thing to yeah. add on that, and I, I think you know, part of for the, it's good for this room to know too, is that while we tend to look at, at um, wine and beer sponsors in particular as you know, potential cash sponsors and product sponsors, they're actually great marketing partners as well. You know, in San Francisco and the Bay Area, because there's such saturation of, sort of craft beers and wine, um, they have their own lists and they actually actually drive new audiences and earn revenue as well. And it's important to note that. Makes sense. Mike, I wanted to ask you, you were telling in, in our meeting before the panel, um, you told a, a funny story about when South by Southwest added film in, I think you said 1994, right? Was that roughly it? Um, you were saying, I, w I want to address sort of the technical challenges of adding something that's not part of your original mission um, in a big way. Uh, can, do you mind telling a, a, a version of that story of, of sort of the, the overnight problems that you encountered when you started with film? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's a real shaggy dog story, so I'll try to tell the shortest possible version. Uh, but back before films were uh, uh, a digital medium, they were, of course, a, a, a light-based medium. And the films would, would, would come to you uh, in cans, and then there would be a huge platter, and uh, a technician would have to take the, the cans, take the film out, spool it together, and then... Uh, uh, edit the whole thing, turn it into this one big long film. And we thought, well, you know, let's to save money, because these reels were pretty expensive and we were a frugal bunch, uh, to save money, let's just build the films one day at a time. So we'll build Wednesday's films on Tuesday, and then Wednesday night, we'll break them all down, and then we'll build the films for Thursday overnight. And of course, we, we found out pretty quickly, like on day one, that this was technically impossible to do. There were not, uh, not enough hours in the day. There were not, not enough hands to do this. Um, so what happened was that we got ourselves into an area that was not our area of expertise. Uh, you know, we knew how to do uh, music. We knew how to do uh, conferences. We knew how to do exhibitions. Uh, but we really didn't know how to screen films, and so um, you know we had to uh, we had to sort of learn on the fly. And I think that, that that's a real danger. Um, you know, when we started adding other components like uh, like chefs and and you know your Tom Colicchios and uh, Anthony Bourdain's and, and that kind of thing, uh, you know, I mean that was a, a different world. Those people uh, they just sort of inhabit a different universe than uh, musicians and, and filmmakers and that sort of thing. Um, so we had to sort of learn our, uh, our, uh, our way around uh, the, the different areas. Same with technology, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the interactive tech guys. Uh, they, they just 
think differently. They just, they just work differently. Uh, but now that we're really expanding into this year, we've got 25 different tracks of interest in our, in our conference. Uh, you know, uh, we, we really can get into all kinds of interesting places um, for, uh, for different folks. That, let's take one, one more perspective on that. Whoever raises their hand first about the, about the idea of sort of um, the technical challenges of bringing something else in. You know, for example, Sharon, you know, your, your film is your core, but when you bring in music, suddenly there's amplification and lights and production and different kinds of fans. And so let's, instead of the hand raising thing, let's ask Sharon this question. Well, I have the best job because, uh, you know, I just come up with the big ideas and then I go to somebody like Mike and say, uh, can we afford this? Can we do this? And, you know, so, so for me, it's, it's got to come organic. It, it, it does have to initiate organically. This year, 2016, I had a short film called Hard Love and Woman with Juliette Lewis in it. And it was about the dichotomy of her and as an actress and her as and her rock band, Juliet and the Licks. So I thought, gee, this would be a really good portion of a night that we're gonna do, show the short and then have the band perform, a 40 minute set. And, th and then that, that kind of starts the ball rolling with, okay, if we wanna do this, what are the restrictions, what are the obligations, and then going to partnership and saying, okay, now we need different equipment in this space because the space wasn't actually going to show film. It was our hub space, so we weren't gonna screen. So it was the reverse of what you think, where we were prepared for music, but we weren't prepared for film in that space. So it's, it, it becomes challenging because you have to consider everything beyond what you're normally going to do there and how that impacts your overall operating budget. But in general, I'm, uh, you know, I have the luxury of kind of just coming up with the ideas and then as a team, we figure out whether they're actually feasible or not. So one one quick thing to add to that is, is that uh, the idea part of it uh, in, 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 uh, in so many ways is really important. People want to come to your, to your show if you've got a good idea and good content, but just making the trains run on time, the production aspect of it, um, if you're running late uh, all the time, people won't come back. Yeah, good reminder for us. Alex, go yeah, ahead. Can yeah. I just add a different yeah. perspective on the challenges? Is um, you know, as from a music festival perspective, when we launched Outside Lands ten years ago, we made a commitment that all the food vendors were going to be local restaurants and some of the best restaurants in the Bay Area. There are a lot of food vendors that travel around the the country and do festival after festival, and we said, no, we're not really going to do that. The challenge was is taking some of these high-end restaurants and educating them on how to serve tens of thousands of people in a fast, efficient way at a music festival, which the education was a, you know, was a steep curve, but eventually they figured it out. And, and still to this day, going into our 10th year, all of our food vendors at Outside Lands are local uh, mom and pop um, artisanal food vendors. And it took a while, but they learned, and uh, now they can do it at any other festival. This, oh, sorry, let me follow up with Alex, yeah. and then absolutely. Um, just a quick question, which is, is there an additional challenge at Bonnaroo because it's so hot there? <laughs> I mean, you know, you have mi more mild weather in, in San Francisco, but, you know, you've got all these food people coming in. You have to worry about more water. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's 800 acres in the middle of Tennessee. We yeah. build a city from the ground up. Um, Everything's a challenge. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there, you know, there's some years when it's 95 degrees and some years when it's 85. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's that big. Of Makes a sense. Go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. I, I just I, the advice piece would be hire professionals. You know. I mean, if if you want to add something to your like when we started the music, you don't want to pretend like you know what you're doing with music. You bring bring somebody to the table that completely understands that piece. <laughs> and the same thing with food, or the same thing with anything else. If you already have something going or you're looking at concepting a festival, then make sure you bring the right professional. That's true with accounting and, and legal, but it's really true also with experiential. Absolutely. Okay, well, I don't want to run out of time. Um, let's, let's throw this open to questions. Um, do we, yeah, uh, do we have a microphone? Yeah, sir, this, this gentleman over here has a question. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruno Chatelain. I run filmfestivals.com. It's not a question, it's a comment uh, I'd like to share. Of 
course, I get to see many and go to many film festivals. And I want to uh, stress the value of the element of surprise when you mix, uh, when you bring something that you're not expected, uh, expecting to see. Uh, one of my best memories out of the 30 times in Cannes, and of course it's Cannes, big budget, etc., is uh, the screening of a free, uh, U2 3D. And they managed to keep the fact that U2 actually was, about, was coming, they managed to keep this as a secret. And get, can you imagine the surprise you are at a tuxedo waiting and you don't know, understand why you're waiting more than five minutes, which is unusual. And suddenly you see, you see amplifiers and all the stuff and, and shit. Yeah, they're on stage and they played. And that was one of the, that was a real big hit in, in Cannes. And I realized y you can do this with a big budget because they didn't sell anything j more expensive. It just brought the, and it's probably paid by the production, but, uh, uh, surprise them, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you too. No, I'm just kidding. It's, 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 hard, <laughs> it's good to sell, yeah. hard to sell tickets on a surprise, though. Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. T T TBA is not a, not a big marquee. The, that's a good comment. Is there anybody here that has an example of when you've successfully used the element of surprise in a festival? No, it's, just, it's too cumbersome, perhaps. Yes? So there actually were festivals, film festivals, that um, marketed very successfully, Seattle being probably the most famous one that actually did the secret cinema stuff. And um, they were huge. And then, like any, everyone else who did it, over the last 10 years, nobody wants to be surprised anymore. Hmm. That's so interesting. They're, they're, I think they're all gone from major film festivals. Bummer. Now. Alex, did well, you? Have, I, I actually yeah. think just the opposite when it comes to Bonnaroo. Ah. I mean, the whole concept and the appeal about Bonnaroo is it's full of surprises and that we have, um, we have collaborations happening that are not planned at the festival all the time, and our fans expect to see that. And the problem is, is that you have to deliver every year with, with these special collaborations. Right. Um, right. And that's harder to do every year. That makes sense. Yeah. Other questions? Um, sir? Well, I have the mic. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Picked you at random. What are maybe the most common reasons for why festivals fail, other than just pure economics? And, and what are some of the festivals in your aggregate experience that you've seen fail? Or, and why they were sort of lost to the ages. What, 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 what do you mean what, by fail, like shut down? Shut down, they, they no longer survive. They are, they are a thing of the past. Who wants that one? Good question. No. I, I mean, I'll, I'll really quickly talk I'm from a food line. I think we have an issue going on where there, is, um, there are so many festivals right, popping up. And, and, and you can't not address the economics piece a little bit. And I'll talk about the other ancillary branding pieces, but, you know, if you have, like, evergreen partners, like Lexus or Chase, or whoever it is, right, if you come to them with their nine festival ideas, they're not going to be like, oh, cool, wow, we're going to do nine more of those and write a check. And I think the same thing with chefs and talent, is that if, if at a certain level, like, it just not, it can't continue to replicate because budgets aren't endless. And I think from a consumer standpoint, what happens is um, a little bit, especially on food and wine, is there are so there's so many options that unless you are just jumping out with something really unique and different, and it is the thing to do, whether it's localized or it's national, if you're not creating the thing to do, it's going to be really hard. Uh, Chicago went head to head with us for our Los Angeles Food Wine Festival two years in a row, and then they shut down, um, and because we're talking to all the same talent because it was they were nationally focused festivals, so. At some point, if it's like, well, I'm going to pick a city to go, and yeah, you're going to bring a lot of local Chicagoans, Chicagoites, in, into the to the market. But if you're trying to get people to fly in to visit you, um, it, it has to be really well planned. I mean, so that for on the food and wine festival side, that that would be my my comment. I'm going to pick on Alex again on this question. Um, you know, we talked a tiny bit before about the idea of saturation. You know, there's so many music festivals in the country. More, you know, five years ago, I remember we were talking about, oh, New York doesn't have that many festivals. And now it, there's tons of them. Are we hitting an oversaturation point? Do you think we reach the point soon where some start to fail more frequently? I think there are some people that believe that there's a bubble that's ready to burst. Um, I still think that there are markets that could use festivals. Um, your hometown is one example. Denver, Colorado. Denver. Right. Yeah. Um, but I also think one of the reasons why, especially music festivals, why they might fail is the promoters or whoever's producing it underestimates the market um, 
underestimates whether it's sustainable in that market, whether there's a demand in that market. And they go and they spend a lot of money on the artists on the first year and they don't sell out or they don't even come close and then they fold the following year because they just, you know. One thing about music festivals is uh, what a lot of people don't know is they lose money the first few years. Uh, you're not going to make a profit in the first year of a festival. Um, and so you're, you're building a brand. And if you're willing to take those hits in the first couple of years, then you're going to build a brand that's going to work. I mean, sorry to keep on bringing Outside Lands, but I'll, uh, as an example, in, we launched Outside Lands in 2008, the same year that Mile High was launched in Denver mm -hmm. and um, All Points West was launched in New York. And of those three festivals, Two of them are no longer around because they lost money, and we lost money in the first few years, but we withstood it, and now we're in our 10th year. So why they fail, to answer your question, is you got to be willing to take a hit the first couple of years. Can I jump no. in on this one? Yeah. From a film festival perspective, I think the most festivals I've seen fail are ones that don't have an authentic local audience. Um, they haven't actually developed a group of people who will be the kind of prime supporters who are going to go to stuff, who are going to make it happen. I um, was involved in the setting up of the Dubai International Film Festival, um, which was this bizarre Potemkin village. So the, in the first year, you'd have these filmmakers come um, and, you know, been you know, flying on Emirates first class. There was no amount of money they didn't throw at this thing. I think it was a $12 million budget um, that they actually did for their first year. And, um, but it played to empty cinemas because there was no actually, there was no attempt to actually build a local audience around it. And so what you would do is you get people who would go there for like two days and, and kind of enjoy the fancy hotel and fly out and never come back. Mm -hmm. And so you don't, when you don't build a loyal following of artists who are going to kind of become your champions internationally, you struggle no matter how much money you're spending. And so that festival actually, you know, ultimately the shakes decided they didn't want to spend that much. And now it's like a pretty minor regional festival that's rightly focusing on year-round programming activity to actually build up a film audience. Um, you know, there's lots of other examples of sort of tourist places, so uh, beach resorts that are trying to do shoulder season festivals, but they haven't done the work in advance to know that there's an audience there. And, and it, the, uh, the artists smell it and won't go. Hmm. We have another question back here. Yes. I know that one of the biggest challenges that you have is to try to remain relevant for any event, whether it's a festival or any, any event, I mean, relevant with your consumer base, with your attendees year-round. Bonnaroo uses a company called um, Custom Channels out of Boulder, Colorado, to create a radio station that actually has the music online all year long so that people can kind of be there and be involved and engaged with Bonnaroo in some form. Tell me about some of the other things that you might do during the course of the year to remain connected with your uh, attendees. I think Sharon might be a good one for this question because we talked about that on the conference call a little bit about what do you do year round to continue to be relevant and then just, just staying relevant in general. Yeah, I mean, here's the conundrum. The conundrum is, you know, we're from April 19th to 30th in 2017. May 1st, we're all exhausted. You know, you, you want to sleep for about two weeks, and then everybody kind of wants to take vacation time, and then you regroup, and then you're trying to think of, okay, what are we going to do next year, or this and that, and so it's got to be, you have to have the brainstorming to be able to come up with some strands of programming that you're going to do outside of the festival arena, and you know, we've tried different things, and this year we tried some things, and suddenly now we, the festival's looming in April, and that may seem far away, but all of you that do this know that six months is tomorrow. And so I think that's the, cha that's the challenge, is, you know, how do you do that? How do you m maintain that um, audience? And, and just to key off that last, I think for a lot of film festivals in New York, it's hard because it, we have a lot of noise. There's so many things going on and so much stuff. But for I've been to so many festivals like New Orleans, New Hampshire, Hot Springs, where it's not just the local audience that's engaged, but it's the local businesses. And really making them your champions too. And, that, and that's, they're more willing, they're that, that's your core that's going to be there for you when everybody else gets on the plane and goes home. 
Mike, let me ask you um, just on the the broader uh, question that the that the gentleman raised um, about staying relevant in general. Um, is it just a matter of well, we got Springsteen as the keynote, so therefore we're relevant, or you know, what, what? Tell me about the complexity of that. I'm kind of the wrong person to to ask that question because I really am a logistics kind of a guy. I'm a okay. I'm more of a production guy than a than a programming and, and content kind of guy, but I know the content and programming kind of guys, and, and I can say it's not, uh, it's not easy. It, it really is not easy for you to try to uh, anticipate what's going to happen, uh, and in our case, because we're an industry kind of an event, we, we, ch we have to try to anticipate where it's going to go, and we have to try to get there before beforehand. You know, it's, it's always better to be uh, leading the parade than, 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 following, uh, uh, than following the parade. Um, but you know, at, at, at the same uh, at the same time, we can't. Uh, we have to try to listen to our folks, and so one of the things that we did uh, quite a few years ago was we developed a proprietary software called Panel Picker. Because remember, you know, we're a conference at, at, at the core of what of what we do, uh, and the Panel Picker is is uh, has turned out to be a great thing because it actually gives the people who are coming to South by Southwest an opportunity to submit. It's like a call for papers in your, your, your regular conference. Uh, Submit something that they would like to present. These are the people that we'd like to have uh, on the panel with us. But then it also allows the community to comment on it. So you can go in and you can vote and say, well, yeah, I'd, I'd go see that one, and I wouldn't go see that one, and I'd go see that one, but I wouldn't go see that one. Um, so it's a, it's a way of crowdsourcing uh, what, we, what we do. Uh, and so we don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. We just have to be um, the person that the smartest guy wants to talk to or, or reach or something. That's interesting. That's sort of a way of using a focus group of your own community, of, of, of you know, get, getting marketing data from your own community and their, and their feedback directly, and that helps you stay relevant with your community. That's and, 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 you know, that, that model doesn't work with, with a lot of other festivals. Sure. Um, but. But yeah, other questions? Um, yeah, sir. Good afternoon, panel. I'm Blair from the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, and we represent uh, four seasonally inspired wine festivals with food, and I'm interested in listening to David and, and Alex's comments uh, on the economics of ticket pricing. We've traditionally run a lot of premium wine and food events. We're seeing creeping costs of food very difficult to return that. We're toying with the idea of just focusing on what we do best, which is wine tastings, and then adding the artisanal component of food trucks and letting people buy on their own. So since we represent uh, a wide variety of wine tourists and we have a pretty authentic experience, do you have any comments on that in terms of going to a pricing, which is all the wine you want for this price, but if you want the food, you pay for it? Um. Yeah, I don't know what your ticket price is now, but I, you know, I think that at the end, at the end of the day, you have to, you have to charge for what the product that you're bringing to the table, and so if you, th we found like we had a monster ticket price increase this year. Like our packages range from a thousand to sixty five hundred bucks uh, per person, no hotel rooms included, for Pebble, not for LA, and we realized we were at four thousand seven hundred fifty on the high-end package and just went to 6,500, so pretty significant jump. But, but the point was that customer, if you're already in, you know, depending on even at any tier, they, they, they're, they want the experience more than they want their cash. And Las Vegas is a great example of that, right? Like, it, money becomes gaseous when you get off the plane in Las Vegas and returns to a solid when you go home, which is why, like, every 22-year-old <laughs> girl somehow magically finds $550 for a bottle of Kettle One at Marquis. So, it's, it's the same thing, is that the more we focus on not price, because I think is if you start a conversation in an experiential world on price, you've lost already. It has to be based on what are you bringing to them, and if it's the great lineup of wines, or it's the food, or whatever it is, that, cre that, that creative um, sort of mix is, is where, so I'd say, so my advice, not knowing the deal, uh, or all the specifics, is you have to you have to raise prices accordingly to what you're what you're offering, and then you have it, uh, then determine depending on where your consumers are coming from, if it's worthwhile for them to do do that instead of anything else. They have options to do that day because of the 
uniqueness or the exclusivity, whatever else you built around that, that experience. So, um, you know, I think if, you, if it's a lower tier price point, I think it's sort of like the, it's like the, the dim sum menu or sushi, you know, you go out and you're like, oh yeah, a couple of rolls here, a couple of rolls there before you know it, you spent like a ton of money because you ordered so many damn things. So if you're at a lower price point, I don't think it's a horrible strategy because it looks like the initial ticket price is a little bit more accessible. And then they realize they spent a lot more money while they were there. So I, without understanding specifics, I'd say if you're there and people are gonna react to the initial ticket price, then that might be a good strategy. But if it's really experiential, then you need to charge for what you're doing. Alex, I want you to take a, a whack at this one because I think he asked you. But also, could you maybe take a quick moment to talk about more so than ever compared to 10 years ago, you know, you're seeing what the actual ticket prices are going for in the market when you look at StubHub and eBay and that sort of thing. And does that affect, you know, either your, your regular pricing or, or your VIP package pricing a little bit? Well, I'm not so sure I'm the best person to talk to about ticket prices for okay. our festivals. <laughs> I will say, though, that, you know, ticket prices increase year to year. And again, eventually you get a little pushback from your fans, um, but there are people that are willing to spend a lot of money for a special experience. And so I think, if anything, our VIP and super VIP tickets have been selling out a lot quicker than our hmm. GA tickets. Interesting. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think that's, we're seeing, I think you're seeing that in a lot of festivals. Sure. Do we have time for one more quick one? No, yes? I think we're just about done. Oh, okay. Parting thoughts? Parting okay. thoughts? Um, I think that anybody have any burning topics to get off their chest? Okay, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Great panelists. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the festival.